Welcome again to Biblical History, and this is Art McCarroll, your host. We're well on the way into the book of John 1, the first uh, chapter. We finally found that Jesus did not come as a real person, so he created everything. Jesus created everything as the Holy Spirit did. But we also were involved in that process because we all, as spirit, and God is the spirit, were there. But Jesus was the one who did the creating because he was given the Holy Spirit in full measure. So we're going to take this first section and start with the conclusion of John 1. But when he wrote it, I'm telling you, he was a good author. <laughs> he knew how to write a book, I'll tell you that. Because in John 1 and verse 15, then he tells us that John the Baptist bore witness of him and cried, saying, This was he and of whom I spoke. John the Baptist was born six months before Jesus, remember? From Elizabeth, his mother, who was of Aaron, was a Levite, who was a relationship with cousins with Mary, who was a Levite. So both started as Levites, and their children were Levites. But Jesus became the priesthood of Melchizedek, which is a totally different priesthood. So it goes on, and now we're ready to go into the book of John, and they give you the conclusion at the end of John 1. So it goes on and said, tells us in verse 16, And of his fullness of Jesus have all we received and grace for grace. It's telling us that through Jesus is how we get forgiveness. Our day of atonement does not start as with Israel on the day of atonement because that's atonement for all of Israel and all the world. This atonement is for the bride of Christ. That atonement starts with Jesus. So what we're really starting to enter into, now I want you to get this context historically. We're going to find out we're going to flow into the marriage of Christ. We're going to talk about the bride of Christ. How it was to come about. How it was to happen. During the life of Jesus is the story of him seeking his wife. The church. So it tells us very graciously. Verse 17. The grace in verse 17. For the law was given. And this is a separation. For the law was given by Moses. That's past. Because that's not what the book of John is about. Moses gave that law, and it was the first step of truth or doctrine. But he said, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. So now we're going to learn about reality. Not just the shadow, not just the type of good things to come. This was the good things to come. It was supposed to happen in the days of Jesus Christ. That's what we're going to learn. The kingdom was supposed to be established right after Christ's death. He should have been resurrected and take control as king of kings and the millennium should have started. But it never did for a very good reason. So the Gospel of John tells us that. It gives us the complete story of how Jesus came for his wife, for his bride, and she wasn't ready. And he had to turn to another gal. <laughs> he looked after another woman because his woman rejected him. She didn't like him. So let's read the story in conclusion in John 1 right now. Well, so we see that grace and truth came by Christ in verse 17. Verse 18. Now, a very plain, simple statement is made in 18 before 
the, the basics begins toward this seeking of his bride. No man has seen God at any time. So I've never, well, I don't know who God is. I will not know who God really is until the resurrection, our resurrection. And you won't know who God is until God's resurrection. We're just learning about God. He's just teaching about himself, about what he's about, how he thinks, how he wants us to be. That's what this human existence is all about. That's why we're here. And go going on, it states, not only haven't we seen God, the only begotten Son, now he tells us where Christ came from. He tells us when Christ was born. Way back before the beginning. Remember I told you that? You always existed. Jesus always existed. Where? Here's where. Which is, no man has seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Jesus, before he was born in the beginning, was already in his Father's bosom. Just as Eve came out of the bosom, you know, a bosom is talking about the middle of your body. Just as a babe is born out of the woman's womb, right? We come out of the Father's bosom. Jesus had a day he was born. He was born from within God, but always existed within God just as we've always existed within God, just as Eve came out of Adam, his bride. Now, that's pretty simple. Not as complex as what we've covered. <laughs> so let's go on. So here it goes on, and he tells us, and this is the record of John. So John the Apostle saying, I'm going to now document this information. I'm going to tell you about it. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, and here's the question, and this question is, what? The question is, who are you? Who was John the Baptist? They wanted to know, was he Elijah? Yes, he was Elijah. <laughs> was he a prophet or what? So we're coming right to this critical question that Jesus had to answer because, frankly, what they were all waiting for was the Messiah. Everybody in the world was waiting for the Messiah right at that time. And they asked him, who are you, John? Are you he who was to come? No, he wasn't. So let's continue the story right after the break. Well, we're going to continue at this time. We took our break, and this is Art McCarroll and uh, your host, so we will continue where we left off, where John the Baptist was asked the question. They wanted to know, who are you? Are you the Messiah? Because they were expecting the Messiah. Are you Elijah to come? Which he was, all right, or some prophet. So they were in a quandary. They, 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 these uh, Levites and Pharisees didn't understand. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elias? And he said, I'm not. Well, he wasn't Elijah himself, okay? But he came in the spirit of Elijah. Remember, the spirit of Elijah always was anyway. <laughs> Everybody could be a spirit of Elijah. So going on. He says, are you the prophet? What prophet? The prophet to come. That was going to tell about the coming of the Messiah. And he answered, no. Because frankly... John the Baptist just was a prophet sent by God to introduce the coming of the groom, the husband, to come. And he answered, no. Then said they unto him, well, who are you that we may give an answer to them who sent us? So they were sent from the priesthood in Jerusalem. And he said, well, what do you say about yourself? Tell us about where you came from and who you are. And he said, 
I am the voice. This is right of, out of Isaiah 40. Remember, we read it in the past where it says, comfort ye, comfort ye. It talks about John the Baptist. So he says, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. And it's right out of Isaiah 40. So this shows that there's two roadways. You could discover the Messiah. You could find out who he is one of two ways. Your way, which is a crooked path, <laughs> it's got a lot of detours. A lot of problems to find out where you're going. It's very confusing. It's called Babylon. The other way is just to follow every word of God. That's his Holy Spirit, which is the word of God we found out. That Holy Spirit in us will keep us on the straight and narrow. And that's why Jesus said in Matthew 7, he says, straight is the gate, narrow is the way that leads to destruction. But straight is the gate that leads to life. He told us about it, all right? So here it's, John is trying to explain what he came to do. He wanted to get you on the right path to the Messiah. So he went on and he said, and they which were sent were of the Pharisees. Oh, so the Pharisees came, uh, were the instigators behind this. And they asked him and said unto him, well, why baptize you then if you be not the Christ, nor Elijah, neither that prophet? Jesus answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you. You've got one in your midst there. Remember, he was baptized that uh, in the midst of you, whom you don't know. You don't even know who he is. How it, how it is who coming after me, he rather, that is coming after me is preferred. He's above me. He's greater than I am before me. Whose shoe latchet I'm not worthy to unloose. This is a great one. This is the Messiah. Jesus the Christ who became the word of God. God's very word in the flesh. A son of man. These things were done in Bethabara, beyond Jordan, where John was baptizing. And I had the opportunity to visit that back in 61 with my wife. And we saw the Jordan River and where the likelihood where Jesus actually was baptized. It was very exciting, exhilarating. And going on, verse 29, the next day, John sees Jesus coming unto him, and he said, Behold the Lamb of God. Here comes the Messiah, which takes away what? The sin of the world. You see, that's the grace. Christ came to give grace and truth because once sin was gone, God could reveal the truth to you through his Holy Spirit. He made the Holy Spirit available to all the world. That's what Jesus did. And that's what he said here. So he went on and he says, This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. How was he before him? As the word of God. The Holy Spirit of God. That's how Jesus always existed. Just like you always existed in Christ. Because he was in the Holy Spirit in full measure. And I knew him not but that he should be made manifested to Israel. So Jesus came first to Israel, his bride. Israel was to be the bride of Christ. Not the Gentiles, Israel. In his lifetime, if Israel would have accepted Christ, as they did when he wrote into New Jerusalem before he was taken and crucified, and they hailed him and said, Hail be the king. They knew who he was. If they would have accepted him, I'm telling you, after he was dead and resurrected, the kingdom would have happened. The millennium would have started, which is the engagement period for your, the bride and the Christ. 
It was the engagement period. It was to announce the wedding feast. They already were married because the contract was already drawn up. And in those uh, days when a man, a husband, and a father and a mother would sign the agreement for their daughter and the son, they're married. That was a binding contract. And the engagement meant it's got to stick unless you forfeit it. And Moses made it possible to do because they weren't perfect. So going on, it tells us in verse 31, And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore, I am come baptizing with water. And John bore record saying, I saw the Spirit. Now, here we go to the baptism of Christ. This is totally out of sync. Chronologically, in John, this did not happen in Matthew, Mark, and Luke until years later, when he was 30 years old. This event that John is speaking about happened 30 years later. But John now is writing it historically. So it's a very vital spot here where we are. So he states, and I knew him not, but he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, upon whom, and I want you to get this, upon whom you shall see the Spirit descending, God's Holy Spirit, that's the issue. That was the word of God, see? He which baptizes with the Holy Spirit. So that's really what it comes down to. You see, that one, if you don't have a definition of something clearer, just read it further, it's going to define it. That's what it does. So now we're ready and we're getting to the place that we're almost going to go into chapter 2, which is significant. So let's take a break at this time and we'll get together and get to finish chapter 1. Welcome. We're glad to have you back after the break. Uh, we're going to conclude now with John 1. It sure take a, took us a long time to do it. But here's the conclusion. After Jesus, he said, received the Holy Spirit descending after he was baptized. And this baptiz baptism chrono chronologically didn't happen for 30 years. He was 30 years old when he was baptized. So this really is covering a synopsis, giving us an overview of the life of Christ through the Holy Spirit, because it's telling us here plainly in verse 32, excuse me, verse 34, and I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. Why was he the Son of God? Not because he, as Jesus, always existed, because the Holy Spirit always existed and descended upon him and was in him. That's what made him holy. That's exactly what Luke 2 says. That's exactly what Luke 135 says. Three different scriptures pop you right in the head and said what made Jesus holy was the Holy Spirit, not Jesus. He was just a man. He was the son of man. He kept telling you the son of man. He called himself a man. He was flesh with God in him. That's what he had. So he, verse 35 says, And the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. Well, he knew because he talked about his baptism to come very plainly. And the two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following, and said unto them, Who do you seek? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say being interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? Where do you live? Jesus, where do you live? Now notice they did not call him the Son of God. They called him a rabbi. But Jesus tells us later, very clearly in Matthew, that he said, call no man your 
master or rabbi, for only Christ is your master and rabbi. So from that moment on, only Jesus became the teacher of the truth. Remember, we read that in John 1, 17. Moses gave the law, which the rabbis understood and explained in the synagogues. But once Jesus came, Jesus came, became our rabbi. He became our master. And it's going to be very interesting when he meets Nicodemus very shortly in one of these programs in the book of John as we continue. So he said very plainly, then Jesus turned and saw and asked why they saw him. And they called him rabbi. In verse 39, he said to them, come and see where I live. And they came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. Well, the tenth hour, remember, the way they counted time, they used the time a little differently. They started, uh, you know, it, the third hour was nine in the morning. Noon uh, was the sixth hour. And so the tenth hour was late afternoon. That's what it's telling us. And they showed him, and one of the two which heard John speak and follow him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. So Peter's brother first came to Jesus. So the first disciple to be called to follow Christ was who? Andrew. And then it goes on and states, He that finds his own brother, then he finds his own brother Simon, and said unto him, We have found the Messiah. They were looking for the Messiah. And Andrew told Peter, he said, we found him, which is being interpreted the Christ or the anointed one. You know, Christ is not his name. It just means he was anointed to be the Savior. Going on in verse 42, and he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he says, thou art Simon. So... Before he was called G, uh, Peter, what was uh, his name? His name was Simon. The son of Jonah, you shall be called Cephas or Peter, which is by interpretation a stone, just a stone. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and find Philip. So what are we concluding in John 1? How he called his disciples. This was necessary. He was following the ones who were coming to his wedding. <laughs> These were the ushers at the wedding, his disciples. So he was deciding who were going to be his ushers at his wedding. This is what this is all about, marriage. I told you this many times in many programs. It's all about marriage, what God has joined together. That's the point. So this is, he's going around, boy, did he pick a crew. They're a bunch of rabble rousers is what they were. Then now Philip was a Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip finds Nathaniel and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. So where did Moses write about Jesus? Read it. It's in Deuteronomy 18. It's right there. The whole prophecy of Christ, right, is written by Moses in Deuteronomy 18. I don't have time to get into that now. We already talked about it. And Nathaniel said unto him, Can there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? I don't know of anybody coming from Nazareth. Then Philip said unto him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Now, Nathanael, L, Nathan, the name Nathan means no guile of God. L is always referring to God. So Nathanael was one guy who was called, at least he doesn't go around hating people. He didn't, he didn't blame other people for his trouble. He figured, I got into this mess, I got to get out of this mess. That's how Nathaniel was. So this guy was a pretty good guy. Jesus saw Nathaniel coming to him and said to him, 
Behold an Israelite indeed in whom is no guile. Nathanael said unto him, Where did, Whence knowest you me? When did you know me? Notice what Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Jesus foresaw it because the Holy Spirit was unto him revealing he, these people. It wasn't Jesus who was picking these people. It was the Holy Spirit of God that was picking the people. That's the issue. And he went on and Nathaniel answered and said unto him, Master, thou art the Son of God. That shows the faith. Remember, Nathaniel didn't have any guile. He didn't have any hesitancy. And what did he say? Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto you, I saw you under the fig tree. Believest thou? You have faith. Then he said, Thou shalt see greater things than these. I'm going to do more miracles. And then he starts to conclude John 1 in verse 51. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Henceforth you shall see he heaven open. And there, we're going to get to that to see it. And the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is Jacob's ladder, now becomes Christ's ladder. So we've got it, we've concluded John 1. We see how Christ became the Word of God. So we will conclude with that statement. And may God be with you, and we look forward to having you again.